Okay. So, welcome to Boston Basic Income. I'm Alex Howlett. This week we're talking about the third presidential primary debate, uh, which happened last week. So I am going to bring up some clips. 0749. So this first clip, we're going to watch it, and then I want to go around the room and get everyone's impression of it. So let's see if this sound works. Ah, I have it playing on fast speed. My impression is that it is quick. Yeah. Um, so playback, speed, normal. Uh, and we're going to go back to 7. That's close enough. That's why I'm running for president, and that's how I will lead this nation. Great. Thanks, Cory Booker. Entrepreneur Andrew Yang. In America today, everything revolves around the almighty dollar. Our schools, our hospitals, our media, even our government. It's why we don't trust our institutions anymore. We have to get our country working for us again, instead of the other way around. We have to see ourselves as the owners and shareholders of this democracy, rather than inputs into a giant machine. When you donate money to a presidential campaign, what happens? The politician spends the money on TV ads and consultants, and you hope it works out. It's time to trust ourselves more than our politicians. That's why I'm going to do something unprecedented tonight. My campaign will now give a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for an entire year to 10 American families, someone watching this at home right now. If you believe that you can solve your own problems better than any politician, go to yang2020.com and tell us how $1,000 a month will help you do just that. This is how we will get our country working for us again, the American people. Okay. So how do we feel about basic income being promoted in this way? Uh, and how do we feel about this clip in general, how he's characterizing basic income? Do you feel like you can take care of yourself better than the government can take care of you, that kind of thing? Sounds very libertarian, right? Yeah. Yeah, so... It's really interesting. I was thinking about uh, Kennedy saying, ask not what... Your country can do for you, can do, ask what but you what can you do. can do. And his was the opposite, really. Um, saying that we're, you know, the country should be, we government should be doing something more for us than we're doing for them at this point. Uh, so that was one interesting thing I thought. Mm -hmm. But in general, when I was watching this, my heart sank when he did that. I have to say, I was sorry that he decided to do that because and I knew how it would be perceived. Not that I don't think it's maybe a good idea, but it seemed to be too. Um, Mickey, uh, and that's the way I think was perceived by people on stage. And that's not nothing, even if you don't agree with them. Uh, there's a, a kind of demeanor that has to do with earning respect for being there. And he already broke through that by talking about, you know, I'm not wearing a tie, and this is like a reality TV show, and people liked it that far. But I think he went a little too far with this. Yeah. Bethany? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in there to, that I could react to. Um, I also thought it was a bit gimmicky and had the same concerns, and then I had bigger concerns when people pointed out to me that it might seem like we're going in the direction of buying votes yeah, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And like this, I don't think he was trying to do that, right. but probably just didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. But that, that seemed pretty concerning yeah. to me, too. Right. Um, in terms of the, yeah, in terms of the trust, I think it's separate to think about what we think about it here, which is which things are well handled by people's individual decisions, and some of those are, and for that I think like a freedom dividend is good, so I kind of like that. Um, with this idea of general distrust in our institutions, because like well-functioning institutions would still have some things that we handle with our own money and some things that we don't. So it's not like a product of distrusting the institutions that we should have a basic income or something like that. Right. Um, so I guess I just feel like the logic wasn't great. I mean, like as in he was sort of throwing a bunch of things out in the opening that don't that didn't really necessarily go together or didn't explain how they go together, um, which is not unique to him. But sometimes I think I like how he puts things together better than this yeah. this opening. Um, I feel like he was trying to just sort of like pick up on different threads that people might relate to, and then sort of do this attention grabbing thing. Yeah. So I I didn't love it uh, for all the people. 
Okay. David. Hey, um, it felt pandery to me in a way that made me very uncomfortable. Um, pandery? I pandery. Like, I, I don't have a good word for it, but pandery. <laughs> um, it, um, you know, I, I read some statistic that he had, like, only speaking time yeah. during this, and I feel like <clears throat> you know, every time he talked, he kind of just threw something out there and then was done. And it's not like how I I don't I have mixed feelings about how he was paying for it and et cetera, et cetera, and like impact on economy and stuff like that. But like he's not talking about that and it makes it hard to take him seriously. Um, and I realize that maybe this isn't the forum that like you know we only have ten minutes or so yeah. to speak. It's easy to bring that up, but somebody's hearing that and going, I don't understand. Right. And how would that work? And just throwing the idea out there doesn't really convey the message. And he's playing to the base there, the people that already support him, and everybody who doesn't already know his message and his details would be confused, at the very least, I would say. Yeah. Um, because I know his general message, I'm not like, I'm very, very equitable, like, quite frankly. Um, I have talked about before, like mixed feelings about how you could responsibly pay for something like this, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it just it doesn't get into that at all. And I feel like that's actually the conversation that we need to happen for it to happen. So he's not really saying anything of substance to me. Okay. Richard. I thought it was an interesting idea, and but it did seem like kind of a gimmick or whatever, but you have to look at like the ends justify the means sort of thing and that you have to look at the, how the results are and well you got 400 and something thousand additional emails that are unique emails or whatever and if one of each one of those um, donates a one dollar then that easily pays for the one hundred twenty thousand dollars in dividends well, over three times over, and so, and then the people were after the debate were saying that's a that might be illegal and things, and then there's a former FBC director saying that that's um, as long as they uh, what is it? It promotes the campaign and it, he gains like inf information and things, then it's legal, and so. People spend a lot more money for fewer emails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For what? Fewer, for fewer email addresses emails. and yeah. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it might net him money. And yeah, that's the consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not it actually succeeds in that is completely irrelevant. Right. If he says that's why he did it, that, puts, that makes it legitimate. Yeah. Uh, Steve. Uh, I always thought UBI was sort of a libertarian thing uh, in every respect. Uh, particularly, as he said, uh, the people know best what their problems are, what they need, and uh, that the free market can uh, fix their problems, can be used to fix their problems, or the free market can be repaired so as to be, so as to actually function and solve people's problems. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, as far as the stunt goes, um, I think it's good that he, he uh, did it because nobody else can do it. Uh, he can just give people money, but I don't think, you know, Bernie Sanders can't say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a 10-person Soviet socialism <laughs> as a political stunt, so. Yeah, it's hard for the other candidates to say, I'm going to give 10 families free child care for a year or something like right. that. Um, and Michael has a couple points. Uh, he says, I cringed a little bit, but I did agree that the government slash economic system should exist to make people's lives better, rather than people conforming themselves to serve and be inputs to the system. So I really like that part of what he said, that you know we're treating people as inputs to the system, but the system is here for us. You know, right. People might be inputs to the system, or they might be some of the inputs to the system, but that's incidental. You know, Ultimately, it's for the people. And I think this is what you were getting at, Mom, where, you know, like Kennedy said, you know, ask not what you can do for your country, ask, or ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you right. can do for your country. I don't think Andrew Yang has exactly flipped that. He's saying, 
Um, he's saying we need to trust people to take care of themselves instead of trusting the government to take care of them. But I would flip, you know, what yeah. Kennedy said. Yeah. I would say, yeah. you know, <laughs> I would say what I initially said, which is uh, ask not what you can do for your country, but what your country can do for you. Yeah. And then if your country needs some, something from you, they'll pay you, right? Um, and I agree with Steve that, you know, basic income is kind of a libertarian thing in the, in the sense that it funds the free market. But, you know, we've had conversations in here. Some resources are more efficiently allocated by, directly by the government, and some resources are more uh, efficiently allocated by the market. Basic income funds the things that are allocated by the market, or that should be allocated by the market. So I, I think, you know, making a general statement about people know what's best for them, well, yes, that's true in the cases where the market is the most efficient thing to allocate those resources. And then when they don't, or when they, they're acting in their own self-interest and it's not what's best for the collective, that's you know when the government has, has more of a role. And I think that's fine. Uh, and Andrew Yang is like, kind of like Bethany said, is kind of like just hammering on, on this kind of like general idea that, that people know what's best for themselves, which I don't think is true. I think you know for some things, yeah. For some things, no. And for the things that, yeah, that's what the basic income is for. Um, so yeah, um, as far as the stunt goes, um, I fully believe that he did it to collect emails. He's running a lottery, right? He's running a raffle. Uh, so it's like, oh, hey, here, you know, get some free money. Oh, out of curiosity, how many people signed up for the, the Freedom Dividend? Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, he got uh, 450,000 mm -hmm. emails uh -huh. uh, from that. Uh, and he said he raised, in like the hour after the debate, he raised enough money to cover it. Right. Um, because uh, if you sign up for it, so the first thing that happened, or a few things happen, uh, I don't know in what order, but there's a whole page explaining like the legal stuff, how he talks to like an army of lawyers, and, and also the fact that, um, so he's been giving out, he's already given out three free freedom dividends as right. part of his kind of presidential run. Uh, he funded those personally. And then that was being called into, into question legally. Uh, so if you read that wall of text that comes up when you sign up for the thing, he says, we were doing it out of, you know, my personal funds, but right. then there were some issues with that because people thought it was campaign related. So now we're doing it, uh, directly through the campaign. Right. So now people are calling that into question too. Yeah. So it's like, you have to be able to do one or the other, right? Uh, and it is something that's directly, um, that's directly campaign related. Um, and I think one of the arguments that, that his lawyers are making is that because it's something he wouldn't be doing unless he were running for president, it makes sense that it would be campaign related. Um, I like Steve, Steve's point that nobody else can do it. Um, other people could try to do similar things, like, that, like we'll give you the experience that you would have under my policy or, or something like that. It wouldn't be quite the same as kind of just giving people uh, money. Justin's son is yeah. doing the same thing. Whose son? Justin's son. A uh, hundred um, basic incomes a month for a year or something? Yeah. Oh, um, Justin son is the name of the person. Yes. Oh, he's, he's a Bitcoin guy or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah, he's a billionaire. Yeah. He yeah. won the Buffett charity auction this year, um, and he's a gang supporter, but he's personally doing it. Yeah. And yeah. nobody's questioning that because right. he can because it's his money. Yeah. Right. Right. And the um, one of the co-founders of Reddit said if uh, if they don't let Yang do it uh, mm -hmm. himself, he would he would fund it for for everyone for all those people. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, one of the things that's funny about all of this is that the FEC can't rule on it right now because right. there aren't enough people on the FEC. Uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? yeah. Mm -hmm. Currently, the FEC cannot punish anyone for anything right now. So if you if you violate you know election regulations, you can't get in trouble for it because the what? FEC is not able to do anything. Why? That is something that is true right now. Oh, so yeah. there are some people who are asking if Yang. Part of the reason Yang did this is because he knew he wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't be able to rule on Wait, it. Wait, but why are there not enough people on the FEC? This seems like a bigger problem. Yeah. That's also a good question. Uh, I don't know the details of it, but you know they have six members. They need. Four or five per quorum. Right. And um, they only have three members right now. Three members right now. Yeah. yeah. Why don't they have more members? Uh, they they need to be appointed, and oh. you know, uh, yeah, and you know, like there's a lot of gridlock. I, I mean, like I think the answer is the general answer, which is there is a lot of gridlock in Washington. It's why we, we why we didn't have a full nine justices on the Supreme Court for a while. You know that kind of thing too. So yeah. But that's really bad. I'm sure people are pointing out how bad that is. Oh, people are pointing out how bad it is. Yeah. <laughs> they don't um, even mean to jump in after other people thought about that. There's something about it being like both parties plus an independent person. Um, right. And 
Each party only has one member right now, and then there's an independent person. Right, so they need one more of each. I guess, yeah. 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 Uh, any more thoughts? I, I mean, I thought um, I, I felt I kind of had like the same kind of cringy response that, that yeah. some of you guys did. Um, but I think it's a really uh, brilliant stunt. You know, he got so many emails, and you know that is why he did it, right? Right. Um, and he's also, you know, like with the three that he's done so far, um, he like talks to them and like tells their story and says like, oh, you know, this person bought a guitar right. and is right. taking right. music lessons and is taking care of, you know, his ailing mother and, you know, like he's able to like generate these kind of human stories. Right. Now he has 10 more families he can do that right. with. So, yeah. you know, I don't know. Well, and also he doesn't attack. And that's one yeah. way too for him to be noticed. I mean, that's a big way yeah. for him to be noticed even if some people feel it's negative. At yeah. least he's not doing personal attacks, which is what the other people do. To be noticed. Right. And something interesting about Yang's strategy in this debate is that this is the only time he brought up the freedom dividend. He talked a bunch of times on a bunch of different issues. He did not mention the freedom dividend except this one time. Oh. And even this one time, he didn't explain what it was. Right. He only explained the contest, the yeah, raffle, right? right? He said, I'm going to yeah. give $1,000 a month to uh, 12 families for a year. He didn't explain, you know, that it was going to eventually go to everyone or anything like that. Yeah. So I think what he's assuming is that. One, a, a lot of people know what he's about now, so he yeah. doesn't have to keep hammering, like, I'm going to give, you know, $1,000 a month to every American. He doesn't have to hammer that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also, you know, the people who don't know what he's all about, they are going to find out when right. they go to his website and sign up for the raffle, right? right? So I think that's yeah. kind of, that was kind of a big part of the strategy yeah. for this debate. I love him talking about other things. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, any more thoughts on that uh, Andrew Yang clip before we move on to the next one? Okay, uh, so here we got uh, Julian Castro. But first, we have to win, and that means exciting a nope. young, diverse coalition of. That was the wrong. Uh, three. Oh yeah, Castro was named me, right? Really? Yeah. All right, here we go. Problems didn't start just with Donald Trump. And we won't solve them by embracing old ideas. We need a bold vision. Universal pre-K and universal health care. Unleashing millions of new jobs in a clean energy economy. A tax system that rewards people who have to work for a living. So this is interesting. Very much. Um, so I was looking at some statistics for the debate. Um, and or for actually the three debates kind of lined up together and how many uh, how much time was spent on each topic and they kind of ranked them and showed them changing between the debates. Uh, and for this one, they said jobs was zero. There was no talk about jobs. But this, you know, like implicitly is talk about jobs. Right. You know, uh, you know, uh, setting up a tax system that benefits people who work, work for a living, right? right. Um, so this is kind of, you know, again, this kind of, uh, this theme of, uh, you know, it's about, the, it's all about the workers. Yeah. Right. Um, and he's talking about universal health care, universal pre-K, yeah. um, I think he said universal child care as well. So this is an interesting thing because child care is something that comes up a lot. Um, basic income gives people more freedom to take care of their own children. Right. So yeah, yeah like something that's interesting to me about, like, not that I think child care is a problem exactly, but it doesn't give you the choice to like stay home with your kid. Right. You're basically, right. you have to work on yeah. to have the kid go to child care. Yeah. Instead of, if you had the equivalent funds, you could either pay for child care or stay home. Right. That just seems strictly better. Yes, it does. <laughs> and in the universal child care thing, it implicitly assumes that the way you get your money is through a job and everyone should have a job. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So the jobs thing, even though it had zero kind of talking time, according to this article I read, it's very much the undercurrent still of everything everyone's yeah. talking about, or a lot of the things people and are talking about. interesting, because even if you yeah. were worried about budgeting, you could spend the exact same amount of money by giving people with kids in that age range that whatever the cost of their child care would be sure. as a stipend that they could use to stay home or send their kids to child care. Yeah. There's actually some like really long-term studies that show that staying home is much worse for children. Really? really? The studies I've seen suggest that it's a little bit worse to send them to child care really young and a little bit better on average when they're a little bit older um, and that those effects are both small. Um, um, th so but it also depends on your socioeconomic status. Yeah, so when you sample um, people who are less well off, it tends to be that early childhood education is like more meaningful than yeah, that. I and I forget the name of Toronto Michigan, they did the long-term study in, but they've shown that um, 
you know, when they offer universal pre-pay to a group of three and four year olds there, the average income of those children is going to be 20 or 30 percent higher. The ability, like the chance that they've gone to jail is much less likely, um, you know, ha overall happier, less health issues, less likely to be smokers, like, and they're still following these kids today at, you know, 30 or 40 years later, and the results are meaningful. Mm -hmm. So these were children that would have been at home otherwise right. with a stay-at-home parent, and were offered the opportunity to go early childhood. Right. But the stay-at-home parent... So there's a difference between, education. there's also a difference between early childhood education and child care. Fair, yeah, but, but Emily yeah. Oster, who's at, like, aggregated across all the studies, mm -hmm. on Mr. Brown, is where I got my figures from. So, like, it might be that individual studies show different things, but, or maybe, like, if you focus on low income, it's one thing, if you focus on higher income, Oklahoma it? has universal pre-K that yeah. these something for students go to because they believe so strongly in these studies right. and how it will cost the state less money to incarcerate these kids later. Like, <laughs> Oklahoma was like, oh, this will save the state money if we offer universal pre-pay. These will be more productive. So, and not to get into, like, you know, what are you doing for the state? You're a cop, blah, blah, blah. But, like, you're less likely to be incarcerated. You're less likely to have health issues, etc. Right. And it was so meaningful that Oklahoma went away. Right. Yeah, and I, mean, I guess they also haven't contrasted it with giving people the money directly, which is what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah and you're, I understand that, but I don't, I don't think that would, I, because I think most children are better off in a <coughs> uh, group setting like that. Like and, yeah, and I realize that's kind of controversial, but like, these kids were otherwise could come with their parents, and they were much yeah, more Yeah, I mean, that's definitely going to be true if your home environment is very low. So, here's a question. When they're home with their parents, are their parents do their parents also have jobs, right? right? Probably, yeah. So, so I mean, like, is are you going to see the same kind of outcomes if if the parents are actually able to be home and spend time with the kids? Let alone, like, I think it's hard to say. Environment, like, right? Well, other thing, like, do you guarantee yeah. the money would be used to impact the child's life? No, you can't. No. Yeah, so, but, so I think you know. Like I said, like my best understanding of the overall data is even without giving them money instead of childcare, like. Yeah. I mean, that would right. be different than free childcare, but... So, I, I don't think we have to choose between uh, basic income and universal pre-K. I don't think that's a choice we have to make. Yeah, um, but that, I wouldn't encourage that choice with my... I wouldn't encourage that choice either. Um, and I think universal pre-K is something that's um, probably valuable. I mean, I mean, like, I think it's definitely definitely valuable to society to have that, to have that available. Um, and, you know, the, I think the issue for me is the question of universal child care rather than universal pre-K. So pre-K is more of a schooling learning environment. Child care is more like, okay, what, uh, what do you do when the kids aren't in school? That kind of thing. Um, so I think that's, yeah, child care is not necessarily um, something, I think universal basic income is probably, it's, probably certainly better than the university. It's just interesting because yeah. we didn't used to have the view, like I think it's really wonderful and like I'm in the workforce, I think women should be able to be in the workforce, but we didn't have the view that like everyone should have to be in the workforce, including fathers too, like right. and that nobody can be with their own kids, which right. is kind of like the view that that's taking, unless you're rich enough that you can afford to. Right, and there's no reason why you can't send your, your kid to preschool, and preschool is usually not the whole day, you know, that right. kind of thing. There's no reason why you can't send your kid to preschool and be a parent who's at home getting things done while the kid's at preschool, then the yeah. kid come home, comes home, and then you're home with the kid. I think a that's, few hours that's a probably day, great. Right. Preschool's only a few yeah. hours a day. Yeah. And there's different phases of the yeah. child's life, like I said, there's like when they're a baby, too, you know, like, do you want to send them to childcare when they're like nine months old? Right, right. Right, and yeah, yeah. be a detriment. But you know, it's interesting that you're talking about it, it corresponds with people having to work, men and women. But really, what what started it had to do with feminism, right? Uh, like which was the yeah. privilege of working. Exactly. Until yeah. women decided, oh, 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 a lot of women saw that it wasn't, it wasn't all that. And um, but staying at home, <clears throat> it wasn't not an option. It was just right. Exactly. It was a, it was a, an expression of freedom not to have totally. to, not yeah. to have to stay at home. Exactly. And then that kind of corresponded the pre K stuff right. corresponded with that. Yeah. And child care. And something to keep in mind, um, you know, is that if a parent is staying home, it doesn't necessarily have to be a woman. Also, no, that's so yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. They even had that movie in 1982, I think it was, Mr. Mom, where the guy's laid <laughs> off or whatever, and he stays home with the kids. I think and it's he a TV up. show now. 
Oh, it is? Did, uh, did someone change the signs, by the way, on the board? I did, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Michael says, uh, the child care thing implies that people taking care of children uh, should get paid the least. Hmm. The only way it would be worth using child care is if you can pay someone else less than what you would make at your job to make it worth right. having a job rather than staying yeah. at home. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I yeah. guess I was assuming maybe the child care person is caring for like a bunch of kids. Yeah. Right, or something like right. That. So you get specialization yeah. and, right. and all of that. So the, the child care worker is, yeah, exactly. Um, well, you don't have UBI, but, yeah. but uh, you're, the government is all excited about job guarantees. I always thought that the moms should just exchange children, should just pay each other to uh, oh, yeah. you know, raise each other's children, yeah. and then everybody has, suddenly has a job. Yeah, That's there you go. Yeah, there's, there's interesting ways to kind of... Well, in some know. ways that's true anyway. I mean, moms do take care of a bunch of kids and other moms pay them. That's the part of right. child care. Yeah. yeah. Pooling that. Yeah. Yeah. You guys ready for another clip? Yeah. Yeah. Our good friend Bernie yeah, Sanders is coming up. Yeah. He's especially <laughs> delightful in this debate. Uh, here we go. His voice is on. Oh, yeah. That this country is moving into an oligarchic form of society where a handful of billionaires control the economic and political life of this country. And as president, I am prepared to take them on. Yes, we will raise the minimum wage to a living wage. Yes, we will finally make sure that every American has health care as a human right, not a privilege. And yes, we will address the catastrophic crisis of climate change and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. <clears throat> okay. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, he, he, I have to say he's got a, like a very clear message. Yes. Um, and he had like three very clear mm -hmm. points. Um, he didn't really flesh out, you know, what would make something an oligarchy or not, but he also doesn't have a lot of time. Um, well, we do climate change, obviously, and healthcare. Like healthcare is kind of minimum issue. wage up to a living wage. Oh yeah, minimum wage, right? I mean, I guess if you dig deeper, like one of the issues with both him and Elizabeth Warren and maybe everyone is they don't really go into like how they're going to take on these powerful special interests. Right. Uh, but you get the sense that they themselves, hopefully, they're trying to convey can't be bought, and like at least they themselves are principled and will do what they can. And like that, I think, comes across as like somewhat believable. Yeah. Um, yeah. In both those cases. I would even believe really somewhat believable. Somewhat believable. <laughs> I actually think it's pretty believable. Although we were just talking recently about Elizabeth Warren and the unions as a special teachers' interest. unions, especially, and, yeah, and whether they're kind of in, in with each other. But yeah, and I think that's true of of unions and Bernie Sanders as well. Right. And, yeah. So if you, if you um, consider that, like, they don't really call out the unions as something they're against, so it's not exactly against what they say, but it's right. a special interest. Thing. But interesting. And they call it unions yeah. as something they're for, like not yeah, maybe yeah. like specific unions. Like we need to promote right. a specific union, but but definitely. Some, some yeah. cases, yes. Though. Oh, maybe, yeah. yeah. So what? In some cases, they do go to specific union events and say, like, I stand with yeah. you and blah, 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 and I support yeah. you and all your actions. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. some cases, that can be a little bit problematic. I mean, there was recently UAW protests yeah. about electric cars and how it's going to cost them jobs. Right. Yeah. Like, you stand with the union or you stand with the progress? progress. Mm -hmm. Is this the one that's happening now? Yeah. 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 I, I didn't know it was still going on, but frankly, I heard yeah. about the other day as a planned action, and then... Right. Yeah. So anytime you're like, what it, like, yeah, you say that you support a specific interest group, then what if it goes against the general public, yeah. like, what's good for the general public? Right. Um, but in terms of, like, the interest <coughs> that they call out, I think that they are probably not easily bought by those. I, th I think that's right. Um, so obviously, if there's a special interest that you happen to agree with, um, and right. you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren happen to feel like unions are in the right and doing right. the right thing, then you don't feel like that's a problem. So you call out people being you know influenced by special interests. You You're influenced like, by special yeah. interests too. You just don't see it as a problem, you don't see it that way right? right. Um, and just you know, uh, the minimum wage being a living wage, you know, that kind of thing. Again, kind of the emphasis on workers. I mean, like the union thing is part of that too. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, for both. Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they're definitely they definitely spend a lot of a lot of their time and energy um, kind of calling out 
corruption and wanting to fight against corruption. I think that's great. I think, you know, we don't want to have, we want to minimize the amount of corruption in our society. Um, but what's a little bit concerning to me is that sometimes there are things that are happening in our society or in our economy for various, very obvious and simple reasons that you don't have to necessarily pin on corruption. You don't have to bring corruption into the story to have a story about why this is happening. Um, and a lot of times they do that, both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so that's concerning to me that they're just using corruption um, as a way of explaining why things they don't want are happening. Sometimes it actually is, you know, like pretty clearly a corruption problem, and sometimes not so much. Yeah. Uh, I guess I wonder too, though, like, <coughs> Andrew Yang was talking at the rally the other day about this as well, that, like, so when you actually get into the thicket of it, yeah. maybe there's, like, a lot of corruption that's really obvious and that it's hard for us to even, like, think about or imagine. Yeah. And that might be part of what they're talking about. And in that sense, it's, it's good that they're so strongly against it. I think that's a good point. And I think maybe even when things are happening the way they're supposed to be happening, it could still be, you know, corruption that's driving it. Mm -hmm. Right? Corruption doesn't have to mean that bad things are happening. Corruption could mean just like just that the the decision making process in the system is not you know democratic or something like that. Yeah, I mean it could end up having some like pro social consequences, but you might still be concerned that it's not designed to necessarily have pro social consequences. Right. So you might still want to change that decision. That's exactly right. Right. So when we think about uh, and this will come up later, but when we think about um, you know the way our Senate works and the filibuster and stuff like that. We can think of that as a broken process right. or a corrupt process, but you know the people who are using it are doing it because they think you know they're using it to, to get the right outcome and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, Steve. I'd I'd like to ask uh, again uh, if UBI intrinsically addresses the problem of climate change. Yes, because I don't understand how. Yeah, Bethany. I think you make good arguments that it helps. I don't think you made the argument that it like addresses it fully. Right. Certainly not. Yeah. Okay. I just want to clarify. What you mean there. Yeah. Uh, so are you, so I wouldn't say that that basic income addresses climate change fully. Okay. I would say that um, you probably can't address climate change fully without having a basic income. Uh, and the reason for that is that without basic income, we waste resources um, on creating unnecessary jobs. Uh, and that creates emissions, you know, bad for the environment. Uh, yeah. Uh, that heating buildings that people, the heating offices and things that people spend hours in each day. Right. So we are, we can certainly um, reduce a lot of that waste if we have a basic income and we're stopping. And, and we're not trying to kind of uh, keep people employed, which keeps other resources employed and causes carbon emissions as well. So the yeah. unnecessary jobs include uh, ones that should be automated, but uh, nobody's in, uh, really inspired to automate them. Sure. The, the kind of jobs where you might pay somebody minimum wage to do, but if somebody's paying income, they wouldn't necessarily want to do, it's perfectly effective to okay. build a robot to do the same job. Yeah. Uh, also Sorry. jobs that, you know, we, um, like domestic jobs that we're protecting when we could easily be importing stuff from other countries, that kind of stuff. Um, it's really hard to say, like looking at a particular job, whether it would still be around if we had a basic income kind of calibrated to the optimal level. Um, but what we can know is that once we have that basic income in place, it gets a lot easier to eliminate those other jobs, and we don't have to start. We don't have to continue thinking about it as like, oh, everyone needs a job. Let's create a job for everyone. That's incredibly wasteful. Um, so, so this is the way in which um, basic income uh, helps. Is an important. Uh, ingredient or an important component to how we address climate change. Um, and then also, of course, um, that's in terms of, of mitigating the climate change itself. Yeah. It also helps us adapt to climate change, right? By um, well, by moving, but generally speaking, when you think about natural disasters, climate disasters, anything like that, the people who suffer the most are the poor, right? right. If we eliminate poverty, uh, humanity is able to adapt a lot more. Uh, to whatever, whatever hits us. Uh, so, so, so it's kind of like these two things um, that that basic income contributes. Those aren't the only things. There's lots of other things we need to be doing uh, to both address and respond to climate change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you guys ready for another clip? Yep. 
Okay, here is Elizabeth Morton. Class have gotten a lot smaller and a lot narrower. Today, service members are preyed upon by predatory lenders in health care. They're getting back here in Houston. By then, I had two little kids, and when child care nearly brought me down, my Aunt B moved in and saved us all. The paths to America's middle class have gotten a lot smaller yeah. and a lot narrower. Today, service members are preyed upon by predatory lenders. Students are crushed by debt and families cannot afford child care. I know what's broken, I know how to fix it, and I'm going to lead the fight to get it done. The path to the middle class has gotten a lot narrower. So, what, what do we mean when we talk about the path to the middle class? Accumulation of uh, wealth is one thing. Buying a house, uh, it being able to sustain a way of life, um, keeping a job, keeping a salary. Yeah. Um, it really does have to do with income and being able to find, you know, educational uh, achievement that leads to uh, good jobs, that then leads to accumulation of wealth. I think of that as all having to do with the American dream and the path to the middle class. Yeah. So why do we? Why is the middle like this idea of the middle class like some ideal that we want to kind of? Yeah. I think people have the idea that like um, everybody being like well, it's all relative, right? So by definition, everybody being super wealthy is that that is meaningful because we define mm -hmm. wealthy by the people who have really more money than everybody else, um, and then. We don't like the idea of people being poor. We associate that with like a lower standard of living, and we think of like we want people to have in America, or that a lot of people have in America. So then we want people to kind of be in this attainable zone, uh, a good quality of life uh, that's sort of roughly attainable for most people in the country, and that's I think what people think of as the middle class. I don't think it's very scientific how they <coughs> think about that, or like right. what the zone would be, or you know what the things are. But that's kind of how I think people are implicitly thinking about it. That like. This is an attainable level of like quality of life in our country. We want people to be able to have it. Yeah. And there used to yeah. be a working class, and I don't think of that anymore. You don't? No. Well, a lot of people do. I know, but I think <laughs> poverty, uh, and then middle right. class, and yeah. then wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just seems the working like class has kind of changed. It, whereas it changed. used to be like you know somebody making the equivalent maybe forty thousand dollars a year. Yeah would be considered working class right. and like they could pay their bills, they yeah. might own yeah. a home, mm -hmm. um, and maybe they you know didn't go to college and their kids maybe wouldn't go to college. Right. But they would be okay. Right. And they weren't living quite paycheck to paycheck. And that used to be working class. Yeah. Whereas now working class has shifted to be abject poverty almost. Yeah. Yeah. Or people class. with, just working yeah. with yeah. a lot yeah. more money yeah. than me. Like like a lot of people in working class jobs make a lot of money. So there's like the you job versus the income doesn't always line up. Like you know, like people who are electrician or plumber or mechanic, yeah. they all yeah. probably make more. Than yeah. I, I would say that those jobs yeah. are solidly middle class and have been for yeah. so that would be considered working class. No, you, you, okay, yeah, working class would, would be like, um, like the high school janitor was probably a working class job. So wait, like was those of them like blue collar jobs, but not working class jobs? Well, that's the same thing. Or that's the same thing. Blue class. I mean, blue collar is working class. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Like a truck driver, right. um, a janitor, like a high school, somebody who right. had a job that paid them a decent wage, but like electricians and plumbers tend to be self employed. Like historically, they've been yeah. relatively yeah. well paid yeah. positions, but like it's a yeah. trade skill. Right. Um, so construction generally has paid pretty well. It's yeah. highly tied to um, income. Yeah. It's more tied to education. Right. Uh, white collar jobs are office jobs. Yeah. Jobs exactly. that don't you don't use your hands. Yeah. So you might make more money as an electrician or right. construction, exactly. but yeah. you're still not in the white collar. Right. Class I guess there's all these different yeah. subjects. Yeah. 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 There are blue collar millionaires. You know, yeah. Right. 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 So working class, I would yeah. consider like blue collar, but not of that income. I see. Right. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting um, how we have these class divisions yeah. in our society. Um, and, and for me, I would say that um, instead of emphasizing the middle class and um, wanting to kind of give people a path to the middle class. So when you say give people a path, it doesn't mean I want to put everyone in the middle class. It means right. I want to like mm, kind of 
open up opportunities for people to get jobs and like work their way up and that kind of yeah, thing. And it's like it's kind of bad. It's like well, it's okay for people to be poor. We just want there to be like a theoretical option, right? Which is like, right. Yeah, right. Like she wants it to be real. But. And and the very term middle class implies that there's a lower class, sure. right? Yeah. You can't be in the middle unless there's right. someone below you. Right. 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 Yeah. That's um, true. So I'm not a fan of that either. Um, I hope we can, as a society, start to move past some of this class language and actually right. move past some of these class divisions and, and barriers in our society. I agree with her kind of sentiment of wanting to have more mobility, more opportunities for right. people to kind of like spend their time how they want, do the things that they want. Right. But you know, something like a basic income, that can put everyone in what we normally think of as the middle class. It doesn't have to be give them a path, it's just, just put them there. That's fine. And then we don't have to think about it as the middle class anymore. But so the yeah. people who would only take the basic income and not otherwise work at a thousand dollars a month would be the new people uh, in poverty, effectively. So okay, so two two points. Uh, so I'm not necessarily talking about a thousand dollars a month for for basic income. You know, I, I typically advocate um, calibrating the basic income to the full amount the economy can sustain. Why would you ever want it to be lower than? You know, necessary, I, I, uh, and then, and then, yeah, whoever's um, whoever's got the lowest income, whoever you know, maybe basic income is their only income. Mm -hmm. uh, then those are the relatively poor people. But that doesn't mean you know we can have we can have it so that the poorest person in our society is living a decent life. I think that would be great, um, and that's okay if you want to call that person poor or you know whatever, then sure, but it's not a problem anymore, you know what I mean? I don't think this with more yeah. of like a social safety net think about classes and like these divisions, because I remember reading things about, you know, in various places in Europe, there's different degrees to which you're not as likely to be so much below other people the way that you are here, or like to be so poor. In, in Denmark, for example, the trash collector makes a third as much as the average doctor. Wow. Yeah. Like, I'm just saying, like, right. that, that's, it's... You know, maybe the average doctor's making two hundred thousand dollars a year, right. but the garbage collector's making seventy. Yeah, like yeah. that's 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 a different. Yeah. And I remember reading about like you know in Norway, like this guy was asked on Quora, so I don't know, it's just one guy, but like he's saying they were asked like you know what is it like to be like poor in another country? And he was saying, well, in Norway, like it just means you can't really like buy luxuries, but you also don't expect to like stay there for that long. So you know, I don't even know if those places really think of that as like poor versus middle class. But right. there's less there's less like stuckness I guess in the low income right. and there's also like a much higher floor so it's a very different kind of situation. Yeah. There's another problem with this idea of the middle class which has to do with everybody <clears throat> going to college uh, and it doesn't have to do really with income although usually it does it's usually tied right. to that but as we were saying there are people with vocations and right. they can make more money but but there is what bothers me about it is this kind of idea that everybody needs to go to college of course from my point of view when right. i was younger going to college was something that not everybody did right. and not everybody could do and not just because of money right. but because they didn't need to right. they had other ways of, of getting along in society that were respected right. yeah. um, and now if you don't have a college degree it's right. not necessarily tied to income, but it is tied to being seen as part of yeah. the higher class, right, right. the educated class. I yeah. think that's a separate class in a way, the yeah. educated yeah. class. Yeah. And I think you know a lot of these class divisions do come from this kind of stuckness that Bethany was talking about and the lack of mobility. Yeah. Yeah. I think once yeah. you eliminate yeah. some of these barriers yeah. for people, you know, the class right. divisions might kind yeah. of dissolve. Right. right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there is like the self absorption uh, or association or whatever, where people put themselves in tiny communities and they only network a network amongst themselves and they promote within it, within the yeah. small groups and things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think you know we're probably still going to see a lot of that. I think when you give people more mobility that more freedom to associate with people who are like you. So this right. is an interesting, uh, an interesting problem too. If you're, if you need to, um, if you need to participate in a particular community because you have to to earn a living or something like that, that kind of forces people to intermix a little bit more. Right. Um, like with India and the caste system, where the Dalits, formerly known as the Untouchables, are well becoming like billionaires and millionaires and moving up and marrying like. The Brahmins, which is the highest caste. Oh, 
how did how do you account for that? What is the reason for that? Well, they got rid of the caste system. Wow. How did they just get rid of it though? Uh, uh, I mean, just by fiat. Uh, uh, so, so first of all, they did it by fiat, by decree. Um, there's still, like, I mean, if you go there, there's going to be a lot of people who are still kind of treated according to their caste. It doesn't go away entirely, which right. is what David's getting at. Right. What Richard is getting at is that there, if there are some people who have now taken the opportunity to move right. away from their, their traditional caste role. Right. So both things are happening. It's still kind of there, but then there's, there's opportunities, and, right. and you yeah. know, hopefully people will move right. more away from it over time. Um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, it's still the case that the majority of people in this country don't go to college. Yeah. Now it's not, um, it's not something, now the majority of people don't go to college, but you kind of do need to go to college. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about social acceptance, it's, it's also about income. It's a yeah, big, that's, that's a right. big part of it. Yeah. Going to college doesn't guarantee you a good job, but right. not going to college... Right. Unless, kind you of, have, unless you have one of these paths that's like lucrative and non-college oriented, right? Mm -hmm. If you and if you happen to like be lucky enough to get into a union and you know like that kind of thing, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know that's not most people, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. Uh, anyone have any more thoughts on uh, on this before we move on to our next? I one? think uh, yeah. David's issue of relative poverty is is a real issue that mm -hmm. a lot of people complain about, but. Uh, in America, the impoverished are actually, you know, very, very rich compared to the global uh, impoverished. Sure. Um, but the, relative to the American economy, um, they really, they really can't buy, you know, most of what's in the American economy. And some people dismiss UBI by saying, well, if everybody, if every impoverished person gets one step richer, then all the prices will just go one step up, and then they'll be exactly as impoverished as they were before. Yeah. Yes, we, we talked about it yeah. a lot with TV, like yeah. I've been here, yeah. and um, there is room for something like this where there wouldn't be inflation, and I'm sure of that. Um, I think that number is much lower than Alex thinks it is, but um, whether the number is $100 a month where you wouldn't really impact inflation in a meaningful way, or thousand dollars a month, there is a number, um, and I, I do agree with that sentiment. I, I don't think it's a high enough number to alleviate poverty. Hi. Hey. Hi. We're talking about basic income. You interested? Absolutely. Cool. What's your name? Michael. Cool. Hi, Michael. Uh, so we're live streaming on YouTube. Where you're sitting now, you won't be on camera. If that's your preference, that's fine. If you'd like to be on camera. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so what were you saying, David? Oh, uh, effectively, like there is a number where you wouldn't inflate prices, at least not to the point where it had a meaningful impact. And so right. it would actually help people. Again, we've talked right. about this before. I, I think that number is lower than some people think it is. I agree that that number exists. If you gave everyone in America $20 a month, you wouldn't really inflate prices. Right. If you gave everyone in America $10,000 a month, I think you would meaningfully inflate prices. Where that medium is, I right. don't know, but it exists. So I think we both agree on those extremes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I think Steve's point was, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was less about price inflation and more about kind of status inflation. Like now, you're, now if you have money, you're the new poorest person, even if you're... But I'll say... It's, it's, it's about price inflation too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then the question is, what um, if you wanted to have the maximum possible basic income without price inflation? What number would that be? It's somewhere between twenty dollars a month and ten thousand dollars a month, let's say. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know what the answer to that is. My feeling is probably that it's higher than how David, how high David thinks. I, it I is. believe it would be a few yeah. hundred dollars per person per month, personally. Like okay. I, I think the model could probably prove that out. Um, I think thousand a thousand dollars a month would be more than the economy. So you're even factoring in monetary policy response. The Fed raises interest rates yeah. to um, to reduce the amount of lending in the private financial sector. All of that. Well, because you'd be paying for it for either printing money or borrowing, the federal debt would increase in a meaningful way, and tax revenue would offset that. Right. So, and then you know, obviously the cost the government pays for certain things would increase appropriately and there's impacts of that. Um, the cost that government, the government would pay for things would increase, what do you mean? Um, so whether or not you're talking about real dollar cost or current dollar cost, if you're raising the rate of interest, the amount the government borrows because we are running deficits would go up. 
Well, the reason, I mean, the way in which you are raising interest rates, mm -hmm. the way in which we do monetary policy is we actually, um, we, we make it so that the government offers to pay a higher interest rate. Yeah. So now you wouldn't lend to anyone in the private sector at a lower interest rate, yeah. right? Uh, so that's not, not necessarily so the a problem. But the federal government would be paying the higher interest rate is not my point. Why is that a problem? Because uh, it would increase the debt over time. And if you're not worried about debt, obviously that's not I'm an not, issue. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a meaningful impact regardless. Um, so, I mean, the way I like to think about it is that we're always printing money. Uh, for consumers. Yeah. Uh, we can either do that directly through deficit spending or we can do it indirectly through uh, mo expansionary monetary policy in the private financial sector, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, most of our money printing is happening through Wall Street. Yeah. It's happening through, you know, the Fed sets interest rates low and most of the money is created through the private sector. Um, right. Basic income can, can shift that. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you're spending money directly into the economy from the government uh, and now you don't you don't have to allow um, the private financial sector to get so big. And I would even argue that uh, calibrated basic income, if you calibrate it to the full amount the economy can sustain, which you think is lower than the amount that I think, yeah. um, but once you have that, you're not going to have asset bubbles anymore. You're not going to have, uh, it eliminates the business cycle. You're not going to have recessions that are caused uh, solely by problems in financial markets. Because right now, the monetary policy is trying to compensate for the fact that Consumer spending isn't high enough uh, just on its own. Yeah. So there are right. non-consumer-led inflationary bubbles, et cetera. Um, I, I don't think you would eliminate it. I think you would smooth the curves a little bit, but I don't think you would eliminate mm -hmm. it. And I think you'd see bubbles pop up in ways that you maybe haven't before. Because okay. everyone is spending, <clears throat> if people, like we've had this conversation, but if you yeah. know, the boss said, right, well, everyone having, having $12,000 extra a year means that maybe they're spending that money on rent, which means that the value of housing in Boston goes up, and the cost of housing in Boston goes up, and that some people are going to leave and go to Atlanta because Atlanta's cheaper, sure. but would you still have a net monetary cost on the cost of living in Boston? Yes. Um, if Andrew more Yang people decide to move to Boston, you would see that in some places. Andrew Yang says that you could get like four friends together and they would be able to buy a... Um, fixer upper house and then they would be in Manhattan. Yes. No. So I think like. the, the bigger effect here is that you're giving people an income that's not tied to a particular location. The housing market and the labor market are very intertwined right now. Um, so if you, if you um, separate those two things from each other more, um, now you've got, I mean like, so you can you can always create a story about how for some reason everybody wants to live in a particular place. And I'm not saying but, that people, everyone wants to live in a particular place. I'm saying yeah. that you see some place that people decide to go to and congregate in where the prices would inflate much more rapidly than the rest of the country. Um, I think that's always going to be true, but I think now the reason that those prices are inflating is because people want to pay that amount. Like people are better off, and and they want to go to this place. It's no longer this thing where people need the jobs and they're desperate. So they have to live near where the jobs are. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, Michael. One thing to kind of like maybe keep into consideration is the idea that let's say someone were to in a, like they live in a major city like New York City, for example, yeah. and they lose their job. The what's what are their current options if they lose their job right now? Their current options are well, I've got to move because there's nothing I can do at this point. You know, yeah. it's like I was barely keeping up my expensive rent before, and now that I've lost my job, yeah, I'm. I'm Everything's going in the cardboard box and we're moving out very soon. Now, you actually get a bit more freedom and choice because now you actually have this, like, oh, we'll actually maybe be okay for a little bit. You know, we might be able to push off the issue of rent for just a little bit until maybe I can find another job. If anything, you could even make the argument this keeps people in their current situations if they like them. And if they don't like this situation, they have more mobility to move. Which, yes. as if we kind of know, that's all the people who like something and don't like something, that's everybody. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I, mean, I think it would allow people some more mobility, but I don't think that it would meaningfully. I, I think that the impacts are unforeseeable. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I, I really feel like you would see some bubbles caused by the fact that you have you get, and it, like, I'm totally fine with that. I'm just saying you would see some bubble. Maybe some people just decide they want to move to like lower cost of living cities, but they still want to live in a city. Well, then those lower cost of living cities will see the prices go up. Um, yeah, I think you'll see prices go up in some places. Um, I, I'm just saying, like, yeah. in, 
you know, whether or not that causes an explicit bubble or whether or not it just leads to rapid price increases is a different matter and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I feel like within a couple of years, you can see people start moving where they want to be. Yeah. Because they have so, that more, more mobility and those prices in those areas would go up. So with housing, it's an interesting thing because um, if you just think of housing as housing, like people need a place to live, you want it to generally be as cheap as possible. You want people to be able to afford a place to live. But if you think of a home as an investment, you know, you want people to invest in their homes, et cetera, and, and treat it that way. Now you want housing prices to kind of go up over time. So at the same time, you want housing to be cheap and you want it to always be going up. Uh, so these, these two things are, are kind of in conflict uh, with each other. Um, and I think you guys know that I feel like one of them is more important than the other. Yeah. Because it's, if anything, like, as we're kind of like very sure about, it's all about raising the floor. That's what we're, I mean, someone could make the argument, if we raise this floor by a foot or two, I mean, now we have less room from the ceiling. Well, yeah, but it's a lot better to have a little room off the floor than a shorter distance from the ceiling. One thing that I found very funny was, so I was listening to a graduation speech um, by uh, Chuck Schumer, for example, who spoke at sure. uh, recently, well, soon the uh, Snowy Room, and he made a very funny joke which went like this. He said, you know, if you are under $250,000, right, you, and you live in the state of New York, of course, and you're you know, in the tuition, you'll actually be seeing a sort of like rebate that allows you to better afford your college and stuff. And if your family makes over $250, well, God bless you, you know? It's just like, you know, at that point, you're sort of saying, you know, kind of exactly, it's like, we need to kind of prioritize the situation of maybe my housing investments is not as good as it could be, compared to, I'm going to become homeless very shortly. Like, you know, right. there's definitely like one is, you know, and it's not to say that the other one's not moral, but also, let's also not forget that these sort of housing bubbles can kind of appear from nowhere and then burst, so it's not like that's something that in of itself is stable to begin with. Need to protect right. Yourself. And I, and I think that's important. There's like, these bubbles always have like a speculative feedback loop, and then, and then eventually that feedback loop stalls out and everything comes crashing down. So it's not just about people want to live in a place and that drives the prices up. The the actual you know desire to treat it as an investment and wanting to buy it and sell it at a higher price, that fuels it too. Um, so in terms of, of basic income affecting housing prices, it might, as David said, it might cause prices to go up in some areas where people want to move to, but it's also going to stall out this, this feedback loop. Uh, and part of that is people have more freedom to live in other places, so you have less of that foundation of everyone kind of needs to move to this one place. Um, so that can, can help take some steam out of the feedback loop. Uh, but then it's also the fact that, uh, you know, as basic income induces higher interest rates, that makes it harder to get a mortgage. It makes it harder to borrow to buy real estate. Um, so it also has an effect from that side of things. Uh, so if interest rates are a lot higher, if you can't get a mortgage at a, at you know, a rate below 10% and you have to pay a higher down payment or something like that, you're going to see housing prices come down. You're going to see real estate prices come down. Um, so there's, there's kind of, kind of both of those effects. Um, but yeah, prices might, might go up in some places and, and that's not necessarily a problem because it's not that, um, it's not, it's not being, it's not causing unaffordability. They're going to go up because people are actually, actually want to pay that price. Yeah. Um, so you guys ready for another clip? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. Uh, laid back, or sorry, yeah, laid back entertainment says only 6% of high schoolers are involved in vocational apprenticeship programs compared to Germany's 56%. Wow. I would argue that, that this is a problem in Germany. <laughs> we don't, you know, like people need money, not jobs, and you're designing your education system around funneling people into jobs even more than we are here in America. Uh, so I would say that, that that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a problem in the same way that. I think that Oren Cass, in his book, The Once and Future Worker, is a problem of his suggestion of paying companies to become less efficient, paying companies to get rid of their robots and hire more humans right. just for the sake of people having jobs. Yeah. Uh, it, it will give people more jobs, but I think it's headed in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, to me, that just sounds very reminiscent of, of course, FDR is the uh, Agricultural Act, where it's like, you know, we're, we're like, you know, letting these pigs go to the slaughter and right. then not, you know, it's, it's, it's not wasteful. wasteful. It's wasteful. And, and I always like the idea is that, like, if anything, this sort of abundance is something you have to harness rather than you have to, like, you know, essentially shoot yourself in the foot. You know, so right. it's like, you know, and, and that was similar because that was another plan to kind of 
you know, mitigate the effects of economic, um, you know, right. disproportionality yeah. and stuff. But like we could see, like that's not good. Right. Well, yeah. if you could give people money, people could buy the pig and the energy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think during the Great Depression, um, you know, Keynes and all of that, we were trying to solve the problem of underemployment, uh, when really the problem was that people didn't have enough money to activate the economy's capacity. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and I would say that to the extent that we're creating jobs or subsidizing jobs to push money to workers, we're not creating those jobs because there's actually work that needs doing. Yeah, like your robots, so you're, you're wasting people's yeah. time. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think it would be great um, if we. Um, Stop wasting people's time and let the robots do the work. Yeah. Uh, so you guys ready for another clip? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here we go. That is in the discussion now about education, Mr. Gang. We'll stay with you. Here in Houston, the school district is facing yet another year of spending cuts. Like schools across the country, the system faces many challenges. One of them, thousands of students are leaving traditional public schools and going to charter schools. You're the most vocal proponent on this stage for charter schools. You have said that Democrats who want to limit them are, quote, just jumping into bed with teachers' unions and doing kids a disservice. Why isn't taxpayer money better spent on fixing traditional public schools? Let me be clear, I am pro-good school. I've got a kid, uh, one of my... Uh, Little boys just started public school last week, and I was not there because I was not prepared for So we need to pay teachers more because the data clearly shows that a good teacher is worth his or her weight in gold. We need to lighten up the emphasis on standardized tests, which do not measure anything fundamental about our character or human work. But here's the big one. The data clearly shows that 65 to 70 percent of our students' outcomes are determined outside of the school. We're talking about time spent at home with the parents, words read to them when they're young, stress levels in the house, income, type of neighborhood. We're putting money into schools, and educators know this. We're saying you're 100% responsible for educating our kids, but you can only control 30%. They all know this. The answer is to put money directly into the families and neighborhoods to give our kids a chance to learn and our teachers a chance to teach. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> well, I mean, he's talking about you know basic income here without talking about basic income, right? In a way, yeah. Well, putting putting money. I guess he's right. kind of being explicit, but putting money directly in the family's hands. But we're but, he's saying the opposite of what we were saying <clears throat> earlier. What was David's point about uh, pre-K and um, being outside the home and learning, so well, having better outcomes? I don't think he's arguing that kids should stay home from school. I right. think he's arguing that in order for kids to get the most out of school, right. they have to have resources in the home. In the home, too. And yeah. in their lives. Right. Yeah. And that affects the huge amount. And I think that makes sense. Well, like, if they go to school hungry, then they're not going to yeah. do particularly well. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. There's just so many other guys. I, I thought this was a good answer. Yeah. Well. Like, I mean, I think he covered a lot of the fun. He didn't talk yeah. about the charter school question. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't really, really, really yeah, address yeah. that at all. Yeah. I was, uh, I was interested in that uh, yeah. because you went to charter school. Yeah. Charter schools in general are they? They're very variable. Um, right. So I think I think that's that's the main idea of charter schools is you have this experimentation, right? Right. Um, so I think it, you know it makes sense to have um, some of both. Right. You know the the public schools implement the tried and true processes and and everything, right. and then you have some charter schools over here that are experimenting and figuring out how to improve things even more, and then you can apply that, that knowledge to the, really to the public schools. really dodged the question, too, about whether or not, you know, about being in bed with the, the teachers' union, right. which I really so, wanted to hear what that was about. Yeah, so about Cory that. Booker actually had a really good answer on charter schools. Yeah. Yeah, he was, oh. I think he spoke next right yeah. after Yang, okay. um, and he was talking about how in Newark they shut down the bad charter schools, which is exactly kind of what you should do, right? right. It's, it's, it's right. kind of like an evolutionary process. You right. figure out, like, right. you know, what's working best. So so he's kind of like, he was kind right. of like supporting that experiment. Shut down right. the bad charter schools, right. I mean, encourage the good ones, and apply those. Well, you can apply the learning from the charter schools to the public schools. Right. It's yeah. like you can't shut down the bad charter schools either. It's a whole other issue. Oh, yeah. yeah that's true. Louisiana. Oh, that's the whole true. issue with that. But. Yeah. Uh, so, Michael, did you have a... Yeah, actually, this was um, 
the charge is cool. Like I said, definitely would want to hear more of. Of course, like this, I think you kind of got like a little thing in the back and just like that. Cool. I think one thing that's very like interesting to talk about, like UBI in, in regards to education. Yeah. Um, of course, because at first he says like, oh, like 65, 70 percent comes outside, so it's like, and I th I understand why people might be skeptical, of saying that like essentially. Yeah, our schools are like done for. We can't like we can't. We should just like give up on those and just you know move to higher ground, so to speak. But one thing that I think is very powerful about that is the idea that like by giving resources to the parents, you are essentially empowered. You're letting them be the parents they want to be. For example, you see, because like and we always talk about stuff like oh, you know, like if people, if parents essentially didn't have to work as much so they can be around the kids more, that, that creates a stronger like student system, as I like to call it, like a student system. Because that's really what a student is when they go to school. They're not just a, you know, a boy or a girl, it's a student system. It's a system that goes to school and it performs well or not based on how good the surrounding infrastructure is around them. Yeah. I think what's really funny is that like, if let's say a parent decides, oh, I'm gonna take this thousand dollars and put into like books or something, they can do that. They say, oh, I have to spend thousand dollars, so, like, I don't have to work as many hours, and I can be the one teaching my kid instead. You can do that. But it's that you're giving people options, because right now I feel like a lot of parents want to be there more for the kids, but the economic incentives are just too crippling. They're even like, it's the classic, sorry, son or daughter, I've got to be making ends meet, and so I can't be there. And then, and then you think about all, like, the mental sort of health, like, issues that come across from parents not being around as much. I think that's one of the things where, like, I know people make the joke that, oh, this is, once again, his, you know, you guy will solve everything. But, like, give it a chance and you might actually see that, yeah, it kind of does. That's so much. Yeah. I mean, in the data, like, all of this stuff is related to income, right? right. So, like, giving people more income should make an impact on a lot of this stuff. Right. But, like, I am agree with you. And, and I think, you know, we didn't even get into, like, substance abuse being higher, maybe over mm -hmm. more conversion, all these other right. things that can have, like, a strong effect on the kids. And, yeah. But for extreme examples, I've talked, well, first of all, talking to teachers, like, I think they would often agree with what he's saying. Um, yeah. Like the ones that I've talked to, that is, if they're in a difficult school, that it's just really hard to combat the circumstances that, that the kids are dealing with. And, yeah. um, there's a good This American Life that I've talked about called Harper High School, which is an interesting experiment in this because they give them, it's a school that was given like a lot of money, like but they don't get to keep the money forever, unfortunately. And that did help them like have a lot more resources for the kids. But the kids are like in this situation, in this case, it's like one of the most extreme, but like you know, they're automatically in a gang, whether they want to be or not, there's all this gun violence, like, like there's no way the school can, yeah. and the school is helping for sure, but it's like, there's a bigger right. problem that right. definitely needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, so, as an extreme example, but I think that you see that in a lot of people. Yeah, there's another, this American Life, that, that I listened to a few days ago, um, from a few years ago, about this, these uh, magnet schools in Hartford, where they, there was this case, of uh, some guy, it was lawyer, brought it, about how these minorities were being were being treated particularly well, so we sued the state, and so they got got hundred. The case took a, like over a decade, and they got hundreds of millions of dollars, and they invested in these schools. But the it was contingent on getting the um, like white students to um, bust into these um, minority communities, minority and majority communities, and. It later it became uh, Asians as well, and they have to get at least 25%, and they, and uh, these schools are just magnificent. They have like the planetariums and like massive aqu aquariums and like ecology. Um, magnet school. Yeah. Yeah. And How are they different, actually? Magnets are public. Oh, they are public. Yeah, they are public, and generally, speaking, <laughs> you tend to have them as uh, collective schools for like a region. Right. So, like, you might have a magnet school in Boston that attracts students from Cambridge and Somerville and. Don't they qualify for them? Well, sometimes. so sometimes char charter schools are also <laughs> public. Um, I think usually, and, and maybe there's some overlap too. I think usually with a charter school, um, it's a lottery system in terms of who gets in. Normally, with kind of important. Really. Uh, Privately run, yeah. yeah. They're, they're um, funded for public money or not. Sometimes you have a charter school that is actually a private school. Oh, okay. And in some states, they can accept charter funds to accept other students, which is the problem I was talking about in Louisiana. Right. Um, um, but the, um, yeah, they're, they're, just because they're public money doesn't make them yeah. public. Um, some of them, well, like there's some controversy where somebody was paying, like as a principal, they're paying themselves, they run the school three or four times with a public school principal in Maine. And they were hiring their brother and their cousin and their aunt and their uncle and their mother and their sister. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, it's, yeah. 
Uh, so and I think not fly to public schools. Yeah, I, I think magnet schools are often. Um, so I know like the Boston ones, like Boston Latin and stuff like that. You have to be a Boston resident. Uh, I thought they were open to non-Boston residents. No, some of the, some of the magnet <clears throat> um, test schools are. So. Some of them might be. The ones in Boston are not. Uh, you have to be a Boston resident, and and like you said, it's a test school. You have to you have to you know yeah. score a high enough score on a standardized test in order to get it. Um, yeah. And that's a magnet school. Mm -hmm. They just call it a magnet school because it, it attracts the right attracts. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I am thinking about schools where uh, I think uh, Richard was talking about the kids being bused into other places from other parts of the city, and uh, so it wasn't residential the way that you're talking about with Boston. Well, with Boston, I mean, Boston's a you know, but, decently sized city with a lot of different neighborhoods, right? right. So, so kids but from all over Boston, all over the city Newton, of Boston. You, wouldn't go from you couldn't go from uh, Newton, but you could go from West Roxbury, or you could go from right. uh, Dorchester or Charlestown or something like that. Right. Yeah. I, I know in Newton North there was uh, there were minority students that were that were using that high school as a magnet school for their neighborhood. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was kind of a reverse. You, you yeah. can um, allow students from Boston to attend there. Um, okay. They have a program where they allow oh, them to yeah, yeah. I know Newton does explicitly. I don't know if Newton counts here, but I guess. Yeah. And I, I know our school had some, some kids yeah. from the adjacent town. And yeah, stuff and like then that. I think they stopped that. Oh, well, okay. they had the students from here, too. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. they got in. Yeah, like Rayanna. Or Rayanna, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you guys ready for another question? Yeah. 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 Senator Warren, to use Mr. Yang's term, are you just jumping into bed with teachers' unions? You know, I think I'm the only person on the stage who has been a public school teacher. <laughs> I, I wanted to be a public school teacher since I was in second grade. And let's be clear in all the ways we talk about this, money for public schools should stay in public schools, not go anywhere else. I've already made my commitment. I will, we will have a Secretary of Education who has been a public school teacher. I think this is ultimately about our values. I have proposed a two cent wealth tax on the top one tenth of one percent in this country. That would give us enough money to start with our babies by providing universal child care for every baby aged 0 to 5, universal pre-K for every 3-year-old and 4-year-old in this country, Thank you, raise sir. the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in this country, cancel student loan debt for 95% of the folks who buy it. Thank you, Senator. And strengthen our unions. This is how we build an America that reflects our values, not just where the money comes from with the billionaires and corporate executives. Senator Harris, 45 seconds. Oh, I can't pause it. My first grade teacher. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so there's a lot there. Yeah. Uh, what's happening? Um, so I guess oh, we'll start with the end. Um, you know, not just, you know, like the interest of the people, not just where the money comes from. So, so, so I always bring this up, which is that if you give money to the people, then they're the ones with the money. Right. So the interest of the money are the interest of the people. Yeah, yeah but, but if you have like, we talked about this too, if you have yeah. like a lot of money concentrated in a few hands, that's still going to have a big influence, even if everybody has more money, you know, across the board too. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I think that's what she's implicitly talking about. like. A very small number of individuals having a huge influence with their dollars. Um, and yeah, and, and I think uh, politicians like Elizabeth Warren often kind of. Um, I'm sorry, I can't get out of this window. It's kind of what's happening. Yes. Um, I don't think that has a lot yeah. to do with charter schools versus public schools. I mean, I think she kind of. Like, <clears throat> That. Yeah, she yeah. says money for public schools should stay in public that schools, yeah. Yeah. and then there's the implication that because you're putting money in one place, you're not putting money yeah. in another place. Right. Um, also, charter schools are public schools, technically, I guess. I guess some of them are not, oh, they're or, not. or they're not in some ways, some privately run, privately funded, yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, I think the issue isn't that money for 
public schools should stay in public schools, it's that we want to provide funding for the education of American children, uh, no matter what school they're going to. Um, I suppose if you have a private school, um, that's kind of something that people are paying for kind of above and beyond, and there's no reason why we should be funding that. Um, I do think the charter schools are an interesting experiment, right? Um, or they allow for interesting experiments. Yeah. I wish people, I mean, it does sort of make me feel like people are kind of, feel like they have to politically align themselves with teachers or not or something. Because yeah. nobody really gets into the nuances of this, or many people don't. Cory Booker did a little bit more. But it's like, you know, people aren't talking about why maybe it's worse for the student's education to take money out of a public school to go to a charter school or not. Like, right. there, there's different debates to have there because there's kind of economy of scale for the money being in one place, probably. But then at the same time, you can have like this experimentation. Yeah. But I think people that's don't good seem point. to really, like, she at least didn't really get into that. She just kind of like took a stand on that. Right. I think there's a balance to be had, and you don't want kind of like to, to speak in absolutes of like all money right. should just. And it's also not that like the money is zero sum, right? Um, I, I think you make a good point about kind of like the ability to operate at scale. If you have everyone in the public school, then it's right. more efficient, that kind of thing. Whereas if you're peeling students off, then it's not like the students who remain are getting the same education. If it's if it's per student, the money, the, the funding is per student, then they might actually be getting a worse education because you don't have a scale. Yeah, so anymore. that's part of the yeah. issue. Uh, but I also think that like. There are a lot of good arguments on the other side too, like you were saying with the experimentation or like right. something like that. So, so yeah, I don't know. I just didn't find it super satisfying. I mean, she made some other interesting. Yeah, things, it's because she's in bed with the teachers' unions. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, too. Well, I still say that once a government program gets so local that it's talking about individual childcare, individual moms and children, then it's the same as UBI, and that the government, the federal government, really. Well, it doesn't have anything to say about it. That uh, you know, universal child care is the same as just giving mom thousand dollars a month and letting her figure out and pay for her own child care issues. Right. Yeah. And giving her the money directly is arguably more efficient. And we have no reason to believe that she would spend that money irresponsibly. Um, or that most people would. Most people would generally do the right thing to take care of their children, that kind of thing. Or if we think she would spend it irresponsibly, then we then we need a, a federal officer of some kind, a federal official, to to visit each house to make sure that the universal child care green is being um, green jobs. Uh, <laughs> so, You're on so, so you could do that, or alternatively, you could just provide everyone free child care and to ensure that it's um it's good. Um, so I have a random question. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever talked about this before, but it's never been in a discussion I've made before. Yeah. Um, what about that child? The child's thousand dollars a month. Do they get it for Andrew Yang's plan? Well, no, no, for like if we were to talk, well, let's say like you gave that to a family, like the test is actual plan. Yeah. Let's say you gave every individual a certain amount of money. Yeah. What would you do with the child's money? Uh, so for Andrew Yang's plan in particular, he doesn't start it until you're eighteen, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, for for me, I would say. Um, you know, you want to give people as much money as possible, so the question is how do you get the incentives right? You don't want to be paying people to have children, necessarily. Maybe you do sometimes if you've got a population problem, if you're Japan or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's an interesting calculation. My hunch is that you'd want to phase it in. Uh, so optimally, you know, maybe when the kid turns 12, they get, you know, some kind of like allowance level basic income or something like that, and then it gradually increases until they get the full amount of 18 or something like that. I think this can be figured out kind of empirically. Um, you know, you start with something and then and then tweak it. Uh, yeah, we had yeah. a meetup discussion on like population parenting, where we talked a little bit about like how yeah. to be careful with the incentives in terms of yeah, the sorry, children. I don't know if that's what you're thinking. No, that, that's exactly <clears throat> actually what I'm thinking. It's just like, you know, it, so like, you know, in theory, if you gave somebody a thousand dollar for each child they had, well, that would cover the, any childcare expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you just gave it for the parent, like they still have children, so maybe they would be required to work still if they had multiple children. Right? Yeah, I think I think the idea is not to necessarily reward people for having children, uh, but more to provide money for people, and then one of the things they could use the money for is having children. Yeah. Uh, Michael. Yeah, one thing that I think is really interesting about sort of this idea of, um, you know, like increasing people's pay. Because, of course, like, look, I'm all for people who, like, work with kids and 
working with preschool children and like you know teachers. I'm all for them getting more money. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, they're important. But the one thing I have a big issue with is how it's done. Because whenever people, if, if it's about a legislation that caps, like sort of like puts like a, essentially a minimum wage, as we sort of should be honest, that always strikes me as confusing and difficult to implement. Because now you would, let's see, there's a minimum wage for a preschool teacher or a regular teacher. Right. Well, then that's the problem we've said before: is that well, you might just have fewer teachers now because like we, definitely, if this were to go into effect, you would definitely have to increase the money going to the schools in the first place. That's because after all, you know, making sure each person gets a bigger slice, but the pizza stays the same size, isn't going to work. So, and that's one of the reasons why I think like. You know, because to get to the charter schools, like I get sort of the argument people are saying this. And he's like, look, you want to help people who are in public, like you know, you know, the general public, people who go to public schools, but you're just taking money, siphoning money from them and giving it to people who really, like you know, aren't gonna, like you know, like don't need that kind of like that. That's one way of looking at. But I think the thing to remember is that because this is again, once again, coming in conjunction with like the UBI, like let's not forget why people go to charter schools. I mean, you know, if a charter school is pretty lousy, okay, fine, then like. Terrible idea, don't send your kid there. But if a charter school is like really, really good and you're a parent who wants your kids to get the best opportunity, sort of thing, like, you know, if, are we really gonna like demonize parents for wanting, like, yeah. and again, in, in those cases, I'll be willing to pay more, obviously. I, I would never be in favor for a charter school to cost less than a public school because, of course, like, that's kind of like a privilege to go to a charter school. But you can't deny people that privilege if they're able to afford that. And I think that to some extent, if people are willing to, like, to go to the extent that they're willing to pay for their kid to go to a charter school, even if it means them taking extra jobs or something, we should still be allowed them to do that. Yeah, so you're not generally paying for your, is this what you're about to say, you're not paying for your kid to go to a charter school. Charter school is is publicly funded. Yeah. Uh, there's a good reason why they're right. Uh, so, so there's private school, of course, which which you pay for directly, and I don't think um, anyone's suggesting that. Uh, that's the thing in some states has come into effect is private schools are allowed to accept vouchers, fancy boss, right. Matt Volker, yeah. So in that I'm thing the organization that she used to work with. But yeah. Right, yeah, there's the whole uh, school voucher thing where now you're giving parents money that they can use to spend on private schools, and I think that that is borderline, uh, I mean like if you give people a basic income they can spend money on whatever they want. Um, so if you give people school vouchers and it's only some people and you know like it it feels like we need to it, it's trying to get around actually fixing our public school system. The charter schools feel a little bit different to me. It feels like a kind of experimentation um, where we can learn and grow and figure out how to improve our public schools. And they scratch yeah. us sometimes. I mean, there are charter schools that right. focus only on I don't know science and math, for example, or classical uh, charter schools that all of the energy goes into a certain uh, subject stream instead of right. the usual public school. And that is an experimentation. And that yeah. might be a choice that people want to make, but they shouldn't have to pay. Um, it, it's not a private school situation. Yeah. It's just a choice within the public school system. That I agree that is worth having. Yeah, it's worth and having I, that experiment. Yeah, I agree with your point too. That it's like it's interesting that obviously if nobody wants to send their kids there, right. then the charter right. school doesn't exist. Right. So there's, there's got to be. Yeah, there's got to be something going on in Louisiana. Yeah. 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 Like to really look at this because you'd be surprised. There's a lot of, typically, like, ignorance about, like, people think that these charter schools are the, um, are going to be more effective for their children mm -hmm. than the public school, mm -hmm. and study it, I, they don't, there's a whole bunch of rules about, like, whether or not you need to publish exam scores, and blah, 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 and they only have to publish data exam scores if a certain percent of their kids are there, so, like, some schools, they're pretty awful, just, yeah. Don't let in enough kids that they would have to have the state make that information available, right. and it, it, it's led to a decrease in the quality of the schools in that state. Right. Right. And, and yeah. it's like a case by case basis. Yeah. Like that's kind of why I think really like unfortunately I, I wish you put it in there. Was so you really should have said like this should be a case by case. Well, just it, not. Here's the thing: though. if you make it a case by case basis, then you're letting kids go to a shitty school right. for a number of years to determine it's a shitty school. But a lot of, a lot of public you can get a lot of feedback too, from right? the students. I mean, like, that's one of the reasons yeah. we have charter schools is it's not a, 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 a word or it's not necessarily going to give you the best feedback. Yeah. That's true. But and the parents aren't true. always necessarily able to be engaged enough to give you that feedback. But I think Wait, David, what are you saying we should do? I, I'm I saying that fixing the public schools is a better option because you have something to hold accountable. 
a better than, option than, than charter, schools. charter schools. Oh, I think, yeah, I think we should be fixing the public schools. I think charter schools are um, an ingredient in that, are, are part of how we do that. Yeah, it, well, the school voucher program explicitly is like the problem that I have an issue with. I, I, I don't like that either. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, but like in general, some charter schools are notoriously awful, and that happens nationwide, quite frankly, but because the way there was, they just, they're just there for three years, so he gets rich off of it, and then they shut it down. So I guess there's yeah. different maybe reforms, or also I like your point about like the parents, you know, if, if parents are buffered a bit more by the poverty and like more income, yeah. you know, it's hard to imagine like an upper middle class family making mistakes for too long, maybe they would, but you know, if you have more time and resources to be engaged and involved in like visit the school and like see how your kids are doing. Yeah, if you're working two jobs yeah, and you're, like, you're, you're, you're right. barely able to like be there for parent teacher anything and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you kind of just have to take what they tell you about your kid as gospel. I just feel like you're, there's an inability to hold some of these organizations accountable that you have in the public institution. So, in a world without basic income, it's really hard to figure out what the right thing to do is in a lot of these cases. In a world with basic income, it makes it easier. You know, it, the parents now have more resources. Um, you know, kind of, kind of to Bethany's point. Um, so, you know, like. Like I was saying, there's a lot of problems that basic income doesn't solve. Um, or I say this a lot. I say, you know, there's a lot of problems that basic income doesn't solve, kind of to, to, to Michael's point before. But um, it solves the very important problem of how to get spending money to people. And then we can look at the problems in our world and we can ask ourselves, how many of these problems are as bad as they are because people don't have enough money? Those are the problems that basic income solves. And any, anything that's kind of a, a consequence of that as well. Um, so, I mean, it's not everything, like Michael said, basic income doesn't solve everything, but it solves a lot of things, because there are a lot of problems in our society that are caused by people not having enough money. Uh, and, and, and being able to, um, you know, uh, be on top of your kid's education and, and, and actually pay attention to that and make decisions about that. Um, people are going to be able to make better decisions about a lot of things if they have the freedom to maybe spend their time thinking about uh, about their lives and, and, and what they want to do with their lives. So, so yeah. Um, I'm going to finish up with a final clip here, uh, and then we can, we can discuss it. Uh, so here we are. So to follow up on what Elizabeth said, why are we losing to the fossil fuel companies? Yeah. Why are we losing to the gun lobby and the NRA? And the answer is this. We all know, everyone on the stage knows, that our government has been overrun by money and corporate interests. Now, everyone here has a plan to try and curb those corporate interests, but we have to face facts. Money finds a way. Money will find its way back in. So what is the answer? The answer is to wash the money out with people-powered money. My proposal is that we give every American 100 democracy dollars that you can only give to candidates and causes that you like. This would wash out the largest cash by a factor of 8 to 1. That is the only way we will win. And as someone running for president, I'll tell you, there's the people on one side and the money on the other. The only way for us to win is if we bring them together. Yeah. So I think that's right. Um, and I think, you know, the democracy dollars, of course, does this specifically for, you know, politics. Um, basic income does this for the market economy. You know, if you are a business and you want to profit and the people with the money are the ordinary consumers, now your profit motive, your, your interest becomes aligned with the interest of the people. Um, so both of these things kind of bring the money and the people together. Um, yeah, that's that. Seattle has democracy dollars, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I knew I heard that somewhere before, and I just looked it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was interesting in Seattle, they had a little bit of a problem where... Um, people didn't know they were real. Yeah. People didn't believe they were real, right? They yeah. mailed them out to people, and it looked like junk mail, so everybody threw them out. Uh, so yeah. uh, hopefully when uh, Andrew Yang implements it at the national level, that uh, it won't have that problem, or they'll, they'll figure out a way to not, not do it that way. It might not even be a physical thing that they mail out or something, yeah. Um, Anyone else have any, or why don't we go around and get final thoughts? Uh, oh, um, yeah. um, I think it was worth exploring these uh, candidates as much as we did because uh, it, it really brings to the fore, because of the ones we chose, uh, how much basic income and the idea of jobs permeates all of their commentary. That, that I wasn't really thinking about that, but they really are talking about it embedded in this assumption uh, of making things better is 
getting more jobs, getting people more jobs. Um, and that's completely not what Andrew Yang is about. Uh, it's so far over on the other side, though. Uh, I don't know. He does talk about creating jobs as well. Oh, he, he does? does? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Too bad. I don't. Yeah, not, not pure. <laughs> not yeah, really. But I feel yeah. like it's less of an assumption, like that filters through, like right. everything that he says, and right. something that he just like, says. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that was my takeaway, I guess, from that. Yeah. Also, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is really interesting. I mean, there's a lot in like each of these clips, actually. Yeah. Um, I do with this one. I do think that it's important to do a lot of reform, but I also do wonder about kind of the way that money finds its way. And I, and I, I don't know if this, if this thing is the right solution or not, but mm -hmm. interesting that he's kind of willing to be creative yeah, yeah. in ways that other candidates, like we said, like you yeah. sometimes laugh at, but there's an attempt to like And that laughter is yeah. from nervousness too, because right. you know, what is he talking about? It's original. Right. And that's what happens to original people all the right. time. Right. Laugh exactly. at, fought against, accept it. Yeah. It's what yeah. happens. And I guess to be fair, like sometimes, those original people are, you know, we don't like the ideas at all. No, we don't. <laughs> but sometimes it's someone that we do, so it's like, you know, right. yeah. Anytime that you're farther from the status quo, like yeah. you're more likely to be either like have a really great idea that's new, or be like totally do right. something really different. Yeah. So I understand, but I think that none of these ideas to me like seem like really crazy over here. Well, not to like, us, but we've been, but, you know, know, with Alex, and we've been, yeah, yeah exactly. Just, you know, representing to other people every week, week. Uh, yeah. talking about this stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. It's an interesting debate. There was a lot in it. Yeah. Final thoughts, David? I mean, and I realize that, you know, this is not really focused on Andrew Yang because of um, the nature of his campaign and the fact that he is supporting this as a concept and et cetera. Um, I, I personally, you know, I, I like the idea of a UBI. I, I disagree on the like, value compared to some people, but that's fine. I love the idea of democracy dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'm kind of disappointed that nobody's ever seriously suggested an idea like that in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whether it's $100 or $50 or something, whatever it is, I feel like saying, like, you should have a say, and you know, Right. That, that's very meaningful, and I, I don't see how anybody can argue against it, yeah. so I don't know why they don't just do it. Right, <laughs> no, I know. Well, they've been attacking uh, Citizens uh, United as a way to overcome that money yeah. in, in elections and stuff, but right. that's not going to happen. I mean, it may or may not. Right. The point is, so I, I'd love to mail a candidate of my choice a voucher for $25 yeah. Yeah. Right. for political office on a you know, biannual cycle. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, it would make me feel like I was meaningfully making a decision in, you know, how... Because I, I don't really feel like my vote counts, if that makes any sense. Know. Like, yeah. I live in Boston. Depends on where you live in. I know, yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. Um, it, whichever side of the aisle I was on, it wouldn't matter. Right. Like, for my congressperson, I have one choice, you know? <laughs> like, it doesn't really matter. And so I, I, I like that idea because you can... Contribute your resources to a more meaningful race. Yeah. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, so, um, well, I'll just say, like, one quick thing on UBI, one quick thing on uh, dogs. Well, I'll just make one quick joke is that, like, so all of us get, like, coupons in the mail, right? And, you know, from, like, stores and tell us that we need to buy stuff. Because the whole idea of sending you a coupon isn't just because, like, oh, I can't wait to get in the lost. No, they, like, it's to facilitate an activity you're already supposed to be doing, for example, right? Like, they want you to buy more stuff from them. That's why they give you these coupons. They're not crazy, it's, it's all calculated right into the system. What's funny is that, like, the reason we can kind of say why we don't have, like, a democracy dollars currently in the thing is because, like, the very institutions in power just don't want us to donate a lot. Their sort of thing is, yeah, if you want to throw, like, $25 to, like, a candidate you know is not going to win, yeah, be my guest, but they, it's like, you know, Want you to donate money. They don't want you to express the power of the purse. They just want you to vote once and maybe attend a couple of rallies and you know leave things be. Like and, and I feel like this is why like that's exactly a bit of like you know most people. Um, in fact, it was interesting because this of course was brought by uh, Larry Lessig when you know like, currently he's a professor at Harvard Law School. But like yeah, when he was running in six, you know in six, he brought this idea exactly. Um, it was just like you know realistically. 
you know, this is a behavior, but things like voting, donating, reading about the news, these are things that in, in a democracy we should be encouraging rather than, you know, like saying aren't important. And this is, of course, just one of those. And as far as UBI goes, uh, it was great at a rally. I was asked by a eighth grader who was doing stuff like this. Yeah, eighth, eighth, you know, eighth grader was uh, doing a sort of project on Andrew Yang and just asked me like a random person, like, said, why do you care? We're like, well, truth is, I'd probably buy like some textbooks, I'd probably buy like some gifts for my friends, probably buy clothes, like, yeah, whatever. But, for me, UBI is not about what it'll do for me because I mean, like again, just completely being transparent, like the fact that like I'm I live in Cambridge and stuff like that, probably not too bad off, I'd so to say. But it's for people who actually need it, like for a person who actually need it, like you know, I mean, and then I was just like, yeah, like, like people will people cry when they like you know they they always make the joke that like oh they have to like they, they dream of winning the lottery just so they can like you know make up for the next month right like this is you know. To a weird idea, it really is giving people the the life that they want back. You know, it's they're like, I wish I could lead a better life. I wish I could do the things that actually make me happy, but I can't because this world isn't good for that. Well, let's try to make the world good for that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. Richard. Well, I think that the uh, society, our political system, actually does not promote democracy itself. They just don't want people to take and to interact with their candidates and voice their opinions to their candidates and things like that. They want um, the donor class to influence politics to an abnormal degree so that they can get their their uh, agenda through. They want their their um, their bills passed that um, benefit specific industries and things like that. Like the the fossil fuel industry, the reason why they get $700 billion a year is because little by little they, incre they increase the amount they had until they finally reached the amount that people started noticing. And, <laughs> yep. and so until something like democracy dollars or whatever, and 16 and people being able to vote when they're 16 years old to ingrain in them the idea of participating in politics, then things are not going to change. Okay, Steve. Um, I was glad that uh, Andrew Yang was starting to sound like the libertarian that I always thought he was. <laughs> and, uh, and not just about UBI, but about, uh, well, the teachers' unions and. Uh, and he's, uh, and he's also the, uh, talking about, he's become the economics guy. Um, and whenever, uh, trying to make every problem, uh, well, trying to address every problem as an economics problem, which I think is, uh, a good way to go, because otherwise you get, well, you sort of get stuck in uh, identity politics. Um, and that's sort of, Trump's territory, and actually, I sort of think that's why Trump will, will actually win because it'll <clears throat> the actual campaign will get stupid <laughs> right at the end, and, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'm sort of, I, in my own really, I'm pursuing sort of the economic view of everything. Yeah. To let's see how far it gets. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Michael says, still not a single candidate that talks about technology or systems eliminating the need for labor, human labor as a good thing, and the system needs to change when it comes to income rather than individuals, yeah. or rather reducing the need for human labor. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Uh, and I have a quick comment on uh, democracy dollars, which is sometimes we talk about why um, health care, um, housing, and education are all so expensive, and that's because we designed our systems in such a way that we give people a lot of money that they can only spend on these specific things, and then it drives up the price. With democracy dollars, we're giving people money that people can only spend on campaigns, on political campaigns and elections. So what it does is it drives up the price of buying an election. I think it's kind of the same phenomenon. So I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, uh, so... Uh, Mitchell is happy that we're on Tuesday this week. We're usually on Wednesdays. We're going to be on Tuesday again next week, uh, and then and then back to Wednesdays after that. Uh, next week we're talking about uh, Rashida Tlaib's Boost Act. Uh, 
Rashida Tlaib is a congresswoman from Michigan, and she introduced a bill into Congress earlier this summer um, called the Boost Act, which has some similarities to basic income. So we're going to talk about that.